Hop Nation. This next episode's a first for the Hop Nation podcast. I am being interviewed on my own podcast by Kurt Batekey. Enjoy. Well, greetings to everybody in Hop Nation podcast world. Uh, I am Kirk Batekey, the uh, other part of Hop. Uh, the other fellow you're seeing on the screen is Corey Sigvaldison, the founder of Hop, the creator. And uh, we're going to give uh, this fellow an opportunity to speak to Hop at his own podcast. I figure it's only appropriate that we give the guy who runs the place an opportunity to talk about what's going on in his world and uh, share that with everybody in the Hop Nation. So nice to have you along. Thank you very much for joining us for this episode today. And uh, first time behind the hosting microphone. So we're going to navigate this as a, in a new way, all of us here on the podcast. So Corey, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Kirk. And I just want to make it real clear to the listeners that this was actually a request that came from, you know, some of the people who follow us is it would be good to hear, you know, some hop stuff. You hear anecdotes when we have guests, but, you know, it wasn't, you know, for my own ego gratification by any stretch. In fact, we talked about how this was uncomfortable to even come to this decision. So, uh, and we're relaunching the podcast as well. Um, this is the um, version 2.0 of the podcast and a relaunch, and we'll have format changes coming down the pipe as well. So, oh. enough of yeah. the business stuff out of the way. Everything evolves, but you're allowed to have a little bit of a platform. So we're going to get that out of the way. So thanks for that. Uh, you know, great uh, opportunity here to get people a little bit more uh, behind the curtain on what goes on at Hop. What Hop is, you know, as you said, anecdotes have popped up from time to time. You discuss concepts and go over them with various guests. But to be able to do that with you and get your perspectives on how that kind of drives Hop and how those conversations take place and how these sorts of concepts can apply across so many different industries, virtually any industry. And to be able to speak to those today, I think is going to be useful for the people out in Hopster Nation. I hope so. I know so, but... <laughs> We'll find out. We're a little self-deprecating, but that's the point of it. We want to be able to have you be comfortable with what Hop is, what we do, and uh, you know, come to understand uh, the power that it has, which is uh, certainly quite something when you, you sit down and think about it. All right, we're going to jump right in here, Corey. Let's start with you. You you often ask your guests, you know, what is that that uh, that essence, that beginning, that spark, that that burning question that's been with you ever since whatever date you know it sticks in your mind that this was the time where you know the muse spoke to you and uh, gave you an opportunity to uh, go down this path so let's start there give us some insight on what that burning question has been and how it's gotten you to this point yeah um it's a great question it's it's weird being on this side um <laughs> I know the question, I wish I could pinpoint the actual day, but it was sometime between age 10 and 12. And it was the question, you know, can average people from average circumstance achieve elite level success? And the reason that question was important to me is I came from average circumstances and, you know, I would say I'm relatively average and that might be even overstating a case, but I wanted to know, like, you know, not just can we get better, but can average people from an average background? And we know because there's so many examples that the answer is yes. Then the question was, then what is it that holds people back from those dreams and big goals they have that they don't seem to grow into and achieve. And, you know, after tens of thousands of hours and, you know, decades of looking into it, it's really two simple things. And it's people give up too easy or too quick. And that's one of the anecdotes you jump to right away because you get to the founder's story with a lot of the guests and how they went from, you know, uh, a current state or a prior state to uh, now current or future, depending on how you want to frame that discussion. And invariably, those people will say, yeah, there was a point where I could have stopped, I could have changed gears, I could have done something different, but I didn't. I stuck with it. And even though it was difficult, it paid off. So that's 
clearly a common thread through uh, many of the conversations and many of those people who have found success, however they define it, but they were able to find it because they stuck with it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And a lot of those burning questions start from something negative sometimes, like the root of, you know, chasing hyper achievement and that, you know, and I can say this, you know, from a place of strength now versus weakness and vulnerability is, you know, that was driven by not feeling good enough, never feeling good enough and needing to go out and do and accomplish these things to get validation or attention. I mean, even when I was, you know, being a class clown and, you know, a teacher's nightmare, um, you know, it was for that attention and to feel good enough. And there was validation in that. Um, but a lot of people, that's what drove them, you know, extreme poverty, right? You know, for those that want to, you know, be able to provide and change the world in that way, you know, money's just one tool to make good things happen in the world. And a lot of pro athletes, especially those from average or less uh, upbringings, uh, backgrounds, oftentimes what they want to do with their success, should they find, you know, financial success is to give back to either family or community or something. And maybe not out of a sense of validation, but out of a sense of gratitude, you know, it's like, you know what, I stuck yeah. with it. You guys helped me. This is my way of, you know, saying thanks and uh, just uh, sharing an accomplishment that these individuals have had. Absolutely. And to move from that saboteur side of our brain and thinking where there's self-judgment or judgment of others to a place where, you know, our guru brain can think, you know, and, you know, every event or circumstance can be useful, right? Even tragedy, right? It's remarkable of what even a tragic event can do where there's positive. And I think of, you know, my mother's accident where she became a quad and, you know, interviewed her, you know, for my first book epitaph theory and that, um, Christopher Reeve after the horse accident and that, and how it triggered him to, you know, get money for research for spinal cord injury and raise awareness for that. Um, Muhammad Ali and Michael J. Fox around Parkinson's disease and taking that point of vulnerability and turning it. And, you know, one of my heroes and early inspirations, Terry Fox, I mean, one leg running across Canada and, you know, we just finished celebrating the Terry Fox run and, you know, his goal back then was to raise $25 million for cancer research, a, a dollar per person in Canada at the time. Yeah. And he's like blown that out of the and inspired others like Rick Hansen. Yeah. We'll talk about mentors and models a little bit later on in the podcast, but I'm glad you went down that road. But I do want to wrap up this first segment by asking about how that burning question and, you know, giving up too quickly, too easily ties into the, the hop model. How do those two things mesh and how can people overcome that hurdle by applying some of what is in the hop model? Yeah, I think um, having a strong, inspiring vision is part of it, right? It should be motivating. And then the goals that they're purpose-driven goals, right? And they're typically not about you. They're bigger than you. It's to better circumstance or condition for others or the world. Um, so that's part of it. It helps with resilience and grit, you know, and that passion and persistence for long-term goals. So long-term thinking and planning and that, um, you know, those are the things. So not giving up too easy and too quick, mm -hmm. right? And doing what's right, not what's easy all the time. And, and that'll make... suck. <laughs> yeah. Life and people will kick you in the teeth from time to time, but at least you can, you know, look in the mirror, you know, when you do make it right. And when you don't, it's a learning 
opportunity and everything is an opportunity for learning, even tragedy, you know, mm-hmm. loss of a loved one, for instance, we think about our priorities. It forces us to think about priorities and mm-hmm. do some shifts sometimes. So. Yep. Your own mortality too, that can play into it as well. <laughs> Provide a, a turning point. And, you know, we could probably do sub podcasts on any one of those topics that you brought up. You know, we could, we could talk about that for days. So without mm-hmm dealing with that right now, we'll just highlight the high points and we'll move on because uh, we want to get on with some of the other topics that we want to discuss today. A little bit later on, I'm going to ask you about success habits, but first I want to talk to you about success components. And that's a, that's a difference. So you have the habits, the things you do to be successful, but what makes up success you know in in your mind is is there maybe a blanket expectation of what success is or is it one of those classic it depends question on the scenario and on the situation on the person um i definitely think it depends on um the individual level people define success in their own way um there is components of success that you'll find you know generalizations around and you know, I don't mind sharing, you know, six things I've found as components of success for me that might be relevant and apply to others. So it's your your podcast. Go ahead. (laughs) Well, (laughs) today it's your podcast. You're the host. um, It's our podcast. Um, And just so everyone knows, Kirk is the one that does all the production in behind. So he's saying it's mine because I'm normally the face out front, but really all the hard work is Kirk. I I get the fun part of getting to talk to all the cool individuals that come on the podcast. So when I have the opportunity to kind of give it to you a little bit, I'm going to do that. So for, for, (laughs) for, for this context only, this is your show. So go ahead. What are are those six components you're talking about? Yeah. So the first one is going to be an obvious one. Don't give up. Right. When you know that burning question and the two reasons that people don't achieve success is they give up too easy or too quick. So not giving up and having that grit and keeping that passion and persistence. And I can think of a number of examples in my own life. And for the sake of time, I won't share those. Um, The second is coaching and accountability. Um, You know, I'm not strong enough to do it on my own. And sometimes it takes a third party and, The science of success um, talks about, you know, deliberate practice and getting focused, timely feedback so you can improve, especially when you're stepping outside your comfort zone where growth actually happens. You have to get uncomfortable, but that feedback is what you do to continually learn and improve. And a good coach is needed, whether that's business coach or, you know, in sport, a sport coach or life coach, if you need help there. Um, so that's number two. Third is um, for me, faith, and it's not a religious statement, even though, you know, I have a strong faith background, um, but faith and knowing there's something bigger going on. And, you know, literally HOP stands for higher order performance. And it's the things, you know, at the subconscious and even outside of our own selves that are going on that um, bring on that higher order performance. And it's, well, you're on the journey to success and legendary, but it also, it helps keep you grateful and grounded, right? To know that, you know, we're a speck of sand, (laughs) Mm -hmm. right? And number four is remain grounded and um, have recharge mechanisms. And I know the times where I've stepped in it and continue to step in it. It's when I allow um, confidence to move into ego or pride. And that's not remaining grounded and or um, going too hard, too fast, too long without recharging. And we've talked about this and we we're seeing a lot more come out now around mental health and that, and, you know, knock on wood, I've been um, fortunate in my life, but I know a number of family and friends where, you know, that's a real challenge. So having recharge mechanisms and, 
that space is um, critical for all people, um, myself included. Um, a growth mindset and a learning orientation with a dispositional optimism. So what I mean by that is, um, well, let me first make the statement. Sometimes a setback is a setup for something better. And I've just learned th that to be a truth. And it's embracing challenges and obstacles as a way to grow. Our confidence grows, our resilience grows. And when we then finally achieve it, our confidence goes and it becomes a new baseline. And it's that idea of always going for personal best. And um, we both set personal best today, Kirk. Explain that to me. Um, I set a personal best on my age today and I'm hoping to do the same tomorrow. And I think you did the same. Crafty, crafty. Okay. I see where you're going. Yeah. And the last one is um, <laughs> having fun and, you know, making positive impact. You know, um, this makes the effort and motivation required to sustain and not give up too easily or too quickly. You know, if something's fun, we can lose track of time. So we aren't giving up because it's fun. And when it's beyond us and there's an impact and a ripple of impact on others. You know, I, I think it's easier for us to give up when it's just us, but when others' lives or something bigger than us is on the line, it gives us um, that extra gear where we find that extra bit in our tank when seemingly we're empty or something seems impossible that it creates a cognitive dissonance and we are able to go beyond what we couldn't push through and, you know, overcome and, you know, be inspired ourselves, which then becomes an inspiration for others. And that's the ripple of impact. Yeah, a level of selflessness. If you kind of take yourself out and say, you know what, I want to do well by a group of people and you're seeing that influence, you're seeing them grow. Uh, you and I are like minded in that I derive great satisfaction from seeing others succeed. You know, if there's something that I'm involved in and uh, I see something that they've somebody else has done because of my influence or my suggestion or even just being around, I feel pretty darn good. And that makes me want to do it again. So there's that positive feedback loop that happens when you're talking about you know, that sort of uh, interaction for sure. Yeah. Well, and you know, firsthand, the reason why we have such a close relationship, um, we had a relationship before an event mm -hmm. and you know, the event and ah, I hope <laughs> I can keep it together here, but um for, for the listeners that don't know, um, you used to work for the Camus Blazers and my dad, when he got diagnosed with terminal cancer, he came to visit and part of that trip was going to be to do a tour of the Blazers and go to the um, change rooms and just check everything out and meet some of the people in the office that you're working with. And the day we were supposed to go down, he was just too sick and sore. And it was near the tail end of um, his battle. And um, I called and said I couldn't make. And he said, well, if you can come down, you know, I have something that I was going to give you. And he gave me a jersey, a game-worn jersey, um, number 38. It was Tyler Bolt, I believe. And um, interestingly enough, as an aside, I got to work with Tyler Bolt. He was in one of the classes I taught at TRU. Oh, there you go. At one point, so I got to share that story with him. But um, and that was super special to get that. And um, what you didn't know at the time was my dad. The only thing he took with him into the hospital room in that was that Jersey because he was in Calgary. I was in Camus and I didn't get to see him. So that was my proxy. And, um, 
when he passed, my stepmom went and got that box framed and gave that to me. And you see that, you know, in the house and that now. And um, that was the impact you had. And, you know, I've talked about how that changed our relationship and changed and impacted life, you know, with someone you'd never met no. at a time when something positive was needed. And um, I'll always remember that. And at the time, I just thought I was just doing something nice. You know, it's just, you know what, here you go. I didn't really go down that road because I wasn't living your world. I was in a different world. I was yeah. doing different things, different priorities, different everything. But for that moment, there was that that intersection of, you know, uh, just a, a simple gesture, a simple gift to this being um, uh, a momentous occasion in someone's life. So ripple of impact. Yeah, you just don't know when that and can happen. Sometimes we don't know our no, impact no. until after we're gone. Like funerals stuff comes out in terms of how people touch lives and you had no idea until i approached you years later because the story's in the book yeah right and i needed you know your permission and you know there's you know three stories in there that you know were pivotal learnings for me and that was one yeah and you never know you know, at the time, you know, going back to that, I was totally oblivious. It was okay. Yeah, I did one thing and kind of moved on. Then you find out after the fact, and you know, you get pretty, yeah. you know, you're you're quite touched by just the impact you can have, and yeah. just keeping in mind the the power that um, you know that ripple of impact that uh, the the as as you said, and the other elements that go along with that that can all spin off and build the kind of energy and commitment and alignment that can achieve tremendous things and if you are willing to you know go into that space every now and then the 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 power is is immeasurable absolutely and i'm going to correct you on something you said you said you're oblivious and i don't fully believe that you did not know the level of impact that's true. That gesture would have. That's true. That's true. You, you knew you were doing something special in that day. Just even setting that up, that was very unique and special. And you knew that, but adapting because I, you didn't have, I think you called me back after and said, you had something. Could I come back? So you did a pivot. So you had to consciously do something um different because i don't think you know it was done if memory serves me correctly well this is know. getting to be so long ago i can't remember <laughs> you might be oh, right but that it was 2005 man yeah that's a long time ago now but i want to wrap up this section with this yeah. and I, I don't want to let it go because i think it speaks into your success components is yes all of those things tie in no doubt but None of that is worth a pound of salt unless it comes with a level of authenticity. And by you displaying authenticity in this conversation right now, that just goes to show the sincerity and the depth that these sorts of things can, you know, can have and can take. So I just wanted to touch on that before we shift gears because I didn't want to let that go. People miss the authenticity piece. They think they need to be a certain way. Yeah. But no. Be and I, I'm pretty sure I'm the only one to cry on the podcast so far. Well, first it, time for me. You, you, you <laughs> did want to reinvent it. So here we go. This here we the, go. This is the well, 2021 version of the podcast. Yeah. All right. We're going to change gears now to, uh, you know, from components of success to mentors and models. And you did mention one earlier. Uh, you mentioned a few. Uh, I just want to highlight Terry Fox, because if people are watching this from outside of Canada, you might not know who Terry Fox is. Look up Terry Fox Canada and you will find out the kind of individual he was. Again, a flawed individual, but he was authentic. He did the things he wanted to do. And he's a, a role model for many Byron. people across the country. So 
Terry Fox and others, who do you hold up as mentors and models as it relates to the hop model and how people can get an idea of what sort of things they need to live into to make the tenets of hop work for them? Yeah, um, because I know the format of the podcast, I actually came prepared. So this here <laughs> is a small little, um, you know, sticky note, you know, thing that I carry around with me. And it actually has, you know, um, my inspiration and lessons learned. So um, I, I have a few. Um, through the military, I learned about team, grit, and strength, and doing something um, bigger than ourselves, right? To think about risking my life for country, right? I admire that, you know, the men and women who do the unselfish act in service and what it takes, you know, to persevere in those environments. Um, sport and business, um, <laughs> effort, um, growth, coaching, the value of metrics and that. Um, now, if I get into loved ones and that, um, my papa on my mom's side, who was really the entrepreneur, the only entrepreneur that I, you know, the first one anyways, that I can think of, I learned entrepreneurship and being driven by need. He had seven kids and, you know, all in, you, you have to figure it out at that point, you know, and, you know, real estate's commission sales. And when you've got the responsibilities and, you know, my grandmother had to stay home, take care of seven kids and, you know, um, French Catholics, uh, you know, they, they weren't spread out. There wasn't a lot of breathing room. Yeah. Um, my Abby, so my grandfather on my dad's side, I mean, hard work. Um, and my cousin Cheryl at his funeral, because that side of family, it, what I love is the value of family and simplicity and she said something that strikes me to a chord every time I hear it. And it says, he, he wasn't a wealthy man, but he was a rich man. And, you know, if I could encourage anyone, like it's not about the stuff or amassing wealth, it's, you know, getting a more rich life. And that's relationships. It's, you know, giving it's so much more it's a richness as opposed to being rich richness yeah, yeah versus wealth mm -hmm. right um my stepdad frank um loyalty and commitment i mean anyone that knows him i mean the guy's literally an angel on earth i don't know how many people who've said it um you know he's a guy who you know grew up wouldn't say shit if his mouth was full of it Right. He was just a pure good man. Like people would say good man or angel on earth. Like his loyalty and commitment is just unbelievable. And you know a bit about him in the background. I know he would want me to be real careful not to share too much because he's a very shy, humble guy. Um, my late father, um, authenticity and um relationships the value of relationships and family and having fun and not always taking yourself so serious like i mean that guy you know a lot of my personality the the rough edges definitely from him and you know i'm a big goof like a lot of people see me show up a different way but you know firsthand i'm i'm a big goof and now i have you know my youngest daughter who's the same she's a little ham and then um my mom i learned about positive attitude and that dispositional optimism 
long before her accident, you know, it would say, oh, well, that's, you know, part of the story. And it wasn't. And, um, and impacting others, she would do things to always lift people up. And I just feel blessed and grateful for those who are close and that, you know, people like you and Kath, you know, other friend Linda, you know, Kent, Littleton and Kelowna, you know, you three as, you know, my dearest friends. Um, there's so many lessons and inspirations, but I could go on literally for hours just on this topic and I'll shut up. Well, we'll stop you there in the in the interest of brevity. Uh, but I, I will say that, you know, oftentimes, you know, we did touch on Terry Fox and some other celebrities, people that people know, uh, but your mentor uh, uh, collective, if you will, it's made up of people you know, rather than people everybody knows. And that's a little bit different in terms of that being a direct influence as opposed to someone to aspire to be like. I just find that to be somewhat unique because most people will give a different answer. And it's interesting that these people have kind of shaped your philosophy and all of those little things you touched on are are common threads through hop there's one thing that hasn't been touched on yet and we'll save that for the final segment of the podcast which is the science element but we'll go into that a little bit so it's really quite interesting how you thread that together and everybody you mentioned is somebody that you know you might be the only one who really knows them but they have shaped your outlook and you know kind of where you are today very interesting so let's yep. go from success components, which we talked about earlier, and now we're going to switch gears to the success habits. So when you are looking at your successful time, because you did hint earlier, you know, I get caught up in my own mess and I have to take a step back and make sure I do uh, find that proper balance. So when you are in your, uh, to borrow a phrase that is out there, to get into your flow zone, how do you, what do you do to get there and what do you try and do to stay there so you are at your optimum performance and finding uh, more successes than failures? Um, good question. Um, and I know we normally ask people to say their top three. So I'm going to try and give my top three. One is goal setting and planning with coaching, right? Um, you need to Goal setting and planning with coaching gives clarity and with clarity, you can get focus and direction and be moving towards something, right? Um, versus away from something. And, and there's a time and a place for that. But, you know, for me and most successful people, you need a goal and something that you're moving towards and constantly doing it. And, you know, we review our business plan and that we literally set aside time and we review that at least annually in a big way but ongoing all the time right so planning you know with goals and coaching and feedback right and, you know and part of that's metrics mm -hmm. embedded in that right because your your goals have a smart component which is measurable um the other thing and this is the differentiator, I think, for a lot of companies is um, focusing on relationships as a driver. And in HOP, we talk about, you know, the two main drivers of high performance are, you know, team cohesion at the group level or corporate culture. Mm -hmm. And then at the individual level, the individual level of well-being. And we know that, you know, when teams are or the culture is good, we're more apt to try and there's, you know, an uplifting support. And, you know, if we're feeling well, we show up and we're able to perform better. But if we've ever had a cold or, you know, we didn't sleep the night before and we aren't well, that impacts performance. So I have to say, you know, that relationships, um, but also that, you know, cohesion and well-being within an organizational setting or a team setting. Um, and when we hear about this great resignation and every 100% of every company 
attraction and retention of talent is the number one issue. 100% of hundreds of organizations I've talked to in the past couple of years, um, by far number one. In fact, they would struggle to tell you number two. Mm -hmm. It's that far moved. And the only way to differentiate for any product or service is going to be the culture you have internally, as well as um, how that's perceived externally. I'm glad you went there because this is a good little offshoot and I don't want to go completely down the rabbit hole, but it prompted a question because uh, I'm seeing it. I'm around uh, some cases, even living it, depending. Mm -hmm. Um, Do you find that there is out there in the world post pandemic 2021 new world order, call it whatever you will, that there is a lower tolerance for bad corporate culture? And people are just at the point where they're saying, you know what, I'm done. My life is too short to put up with this environment. And the companies that figure out how to create a positive and um, empowering corporate culture are the ones that are going to be healthiest. I know that's a kind of a convoluted question, but are you basically uh, seeing that people aren't putting up with that BS anymore? It's got to be a good place to work. You know, Time, time will tell. I, I would hypothesize that's definitely, you know, what I see and feel and talking with people that seems to be, you know, where there's greater retention or longevity within an organization. It has a better culture and there's opportunities for growth, um, feelings of appreciation and, you know, a wanting to belong like you don't want to leave the opposite's also true. And in a day and age where any product or service can be turned to a commodity, which becomes a race to the bottom, because once you're a commodity, you have to compete on price. And we're seeing a lot of companies, unfortunately, um, and the pandemics created an artificial environment, but they're focusing on the middle of a financial statement, which is the expenses, which you're playing a finite game because there's only so much room to play on the expense side, you know, and to solve that issue is to work more on the top line, the revenue, because the more money you make, the more it's going to cover off potential expenses and, you know, even profitability, because if you're cutting expenses, but it's hurting your profitability and brand and reputation and, you know, that becomes a snake eating its tail. Is that because that's the world that is safe to those people? Like they, they're only comfortable cutting the things they can. Maybe that's more controllable than trying to drive revenue and it's a little bit less daunting and less visionary or am I barking it's the wrong tree? short term thinking and reactionary and it's the easy thing to do. It's, you know, it'll satisfy shareholders that you're being fiscally responsible when in fact, you could actually be being fiscally irresponsible if it's going to cost more, right, down the road. You know, not only that, what's going to happen when things turn and demand starts going up and you need to scale quickly and you've created this reputation and culture of, you know, it's all about just the bottom line and, you know, it's it's going to be exposed and those that will survive long term and take that strategic long term view and play the long game versus the short game um, will win and win very big. And that's not just Sigvaldison and Hawk. You know, um, one of my favorite authors, Jim Collins, the book Great by Choice, did longitudinal studies, you know, through, you know, his position at Harvard that looked at Fortune 500 companies and compared, you know, the top companies in there over a long period of time compared to the rest in a field. And um, one thing they found was 80% of their strategic objectives or values stayed consistent over decades. So there was still an agility and a need to adapt, but the majority right? They stayed at that in the A range, right? Long term, because, you know, the foundation that things are built on still solid, you know, some of it 
will grow and adapt. Um, whereas the other peers and the underperformers had well under 50%. They, and a lot of organizations will change strategy or objectives, you know, with every leadership. And it's, you know, every three to five years. Well, that's, it, it's yeah. more about the leader trying to make their mark than what's best yeah. for the organization and all stakeholders. And it's not the long game. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, as much as the markets talk long-term, you know, behaviors and measurements or quarterly earnings, annual People work on an annual budgets and planning cycles and, you know, very little is, you know, played at the strategic level. That's for anyone with chief in their name. Mm -hmm. And that's where, you know, I think this is a good time to segue into what's next for HOP because those kinds of things you're talking about, long game coaching, visionary, uh, you know, sticking with the plan, you know, all, all of those things are elements of HOP and you have dedicated a lot of time in studying what you know team cohesion is all about team performance how to get from average to elite that is really where you dug into the science and discovered a lot of uh, elements that tie into you know what hop is but the question now is what is next and you've gotten this far with it and i want in your words to have you explain where you know hop is at the moment in terms of its you know of uh, philosophy its position and and where it's kind of sitting in the, the the grand scheme of things when it comes to uh, you know training and coaching etc and where it's moving into because this is very you know 21st century stuff yeah so um as you know but share with the listeners we've um kind of went and you know ate you know from our own plate so to speak here in the past year and invested in really up leveling our own company in that and invested even more in the science and technology to help drive insights at a level beyond anything we've done before that's going to create even greater impact so we've made major investments into neurotechnologies so not just dealing with kind of the psychology and the theoretical but now connecting all of that that we know and metrics to literally um the neurobiological level and these measurements to see what's going on and rewiring people from the inside out in a literal sense and then um we know that data and insights are critical to find you know the gaps and where we can improve well we've invested into big data platform and you know getting you know artificial intelligence and you know finding correlations and you know that sliver that can be a difference maker and whereas a lot of companies and you know statisticians with pro sports teams or organizations you know, use um, statistical modeling in that um, with things that are set um, to find, you know, gaps and how to exploit a gap. Um, what we're doing at Hop is we're actually creating the gap and, you know, really growing that and exploiting it for the clients we deal with. And the thing we're doing different too is we've decided to be very exclusive and you know you pay for exclusivity so our price point has changed we've changed kind of our market so we're no longer you know basically a mid-market player in terms of our clients because the price point that we're in now is you know for an exclusive market and when we say exclusive we will only work with one team per league or one national team you know, if we're working with a rugby team, we're only working with one country's rugby team, you know, for the men's or women's team um, or one industry in the corporate side. So if we were looking at Microsoft, Dell, HP, Lenovo, 
we would only work with one of those companies. So as much as, um, you know, they need to interview and get comfortable and vet us because we're literally making a commitment to be exclusive and confidentiality is a must. They don't want people to know they're working with us because we're the secret weapon in behind, right? And that's okay. We're the, that it factor. And really we've went and researched what is the it factor? We hear about it and we hear about people playing with heart and soul. Well, we've looked at it from the science of the neurobiology of that, as well as what that actually means and what the component pieces are. And um, I'm not going to say much more than that because I'm not going to give away our trade secrets because we're in a space where, you know, we have strategic partners that are already working in the fields and working with like 550 plus professional teams and elite teams around the world who are saying, you know, this is something different that no one's doing. Um, so we know we have a bit of blue ocean, which doesn't happen. And I'm sure, you know, at some point someone's going to catch up, but I, you know, our desire is we're moving into this blue ocean space. We're going to have our major launch going into 2022 we're currently doing a bunch of interviews, you know, for clients under the new Unstoppable Force program and doing some beta testing with, you know, some of the new technologies and that, which um, is taking what we've already done successfully to a whole new level. What's nice about having your own podcast is you don't have to pay for the advertising. So uh, tongue planted firmly in cheek. Uh, there was an opportunity to get that out there. But in all sincerity, these are things that we're excited about. And, you know, Corey, you and I have talked multiple times over the last number of years that about how a company or a team that is bold enough to, you know, step into that space, you know, leap into that unknown and give something different a try. Uh, you you might be surprised at just how effective it can be because I've seen personally um, as a leader, I've seen how this kind of philosophy can help drive engagement, drive performance. And it is a difference maker. Uh, sure. Corey and I have drunk the Kool-Aid, but if this passes the sniff test, we certainly would uh, uh, be more than welcome to have a conversation and find out uh, what your expectations are out there in Hopster Nation and just have a deeper conversation. And uh, again, we're, we're excited about it. If you're not, hey, that's totally fine, but uh, at least an opportunity to share what we're excited about and uh, using our own platform to do that. You know, as Corey said earlier at the beginning, you know, people have asked, you know, what are you guys all about? You know, let's hear about what the, you're doing. Well, here it is. So take it or leave it. It's totally up to you. But we're pretty excited about it. And I think if uh, people are willing to step into that space, they might be pleasantly surprised by what they find. Yeah. And, you know, if people want to learn a little more about what we're talking about and that, check out Hop Performance, H O P performance.com. That's our new website, and um, you'll learn a little more about what we're about. And, you know, there's lots of different information you can get there. And I'm looking forward to seeing the new rebrand that you do with the um, podcast. And I know we have another first coming up on Monday. I have a third time podcast host coming on. The, he was the first two-time podcast guest and he will be the third time which is a first and uh, a best-selling author a couple times over and his latest book which came out on April 12th when we were originally going to record it um, we're doing the recording and it's already a bestseller well so. now as the people are watching this, I will have done the work behind the scenes to repackage all of this. So there's a little bit of a, a non sequitur here as people are watching, but you're, as you're seeing the finished product, that's the new version. And uh, I think for episode two of version two, series two, if you will, uh, you'll enjoy the guest. He's, uh, yeah, he, he's not an unknown entity. And uh, if you're an avid reader on uh, business and things like um, uh, budgeting and profit 
if I don't give it away too much. This one's marketing. There you go. So lots of things to learn. Corey, uh, we're over 45 minutes, but you know what? This was a good conversation. Uh, thanks very much for you know creating that space uh, to have this conversation. Thank uh, you, the people out there who asked Corey to take the time to go into a little bit more depth about Hop and give you an idea of you know what's possible. It's pretty cool. Yeah, we're biased. We'll be completely upfront about that, but you know what? We welcome any conversation and uh, look forward to sharing more with you in great depth. Corey, take care, sir. Have a good one, and we'll see you next time. Thank you, Captain. And, and uh, go ahead. Um, the other thing on the podcast was we're going to go to panel discussions and that too, and have multiple guests on and have, you know, even tighter tidbits and that, which will be fun because then you get an interaction in that. And Absolutely. That's going to be a hit. Good, good time. Some some good work to be done on those long Canadian winter months, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, Hawk Nation, for tuning in this week. And if you haven't already, again, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, like us, and share with friends. And we look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you.